Welcome back inside my wardrobe and another chat with an inspiring guest for the Pod 20 on podcast radio. This is a bloke called Simon Squibb. He left school at the age of 15 and left home at the same time and hit the ground running. He is a very successful entrepreneur, but successful in every sense of the word, not just financial. Although he financially has been very successful, he has a very successful life. I got the feeling he's in a really good place. And now he's giving back. He's helping other business people and entrepreneurs. Like, not just a few. He wants to help a million. You grew up St. Neots, Cambridgeshire? Yeah, I grew up in St. Neots and Cambridge. And uh, at 15 years old, I left school and, start, and left home and started a company. Now, so, why yeah, did you why did you leave school at at fifteen, and how were you allowed to do that? Well, I, I, it's interesting because these days it seems like they're a lot stricter. To be honest, um, it was a my father passed away uh, suddenly of a heart attack, and I um, had an argument with my mother, all within the space of a month. And um, my mother and I fell out. My mother said my rules will get out, so I said, okay, I'll get out. And, uh, and, and then I moved into a squat pretty much just around the corner from where I grew up and um, realized quite quickly that I need to pay rent. And that's when I was thrust into the world of entrepreneurship. And frankly, there just wasn't time for school. I, um, I suddenly found myself having to earn money to pay bills and school seemed quite trivial and unimportant at that, at that moment. So, so yeah, I, uh, I just got thrust into being an entrepreneur and had to learn the hard way what, what it's all about. And what was that business? It was a gardening company, very very low tech. It's actually a, a story I tell because people always say, oh, um, I'm an angel investor today. So people come to me looking for money. And I always say to people, are you sure you need that money? You know, if you can start a business without money, sometimes it's a lot better. If you have an investor, even me, uh, you can accidentally end up having a boss. Um, but the trend is to get an investor and that's not always the best way. So I, actually for me, when I started the business, I just saw that someone had a messy garden and a big house. And put the two together and thought, well, they, you know, they've got a big house, so they must have money, um, but they clearly don't have time to take care of their garden. So I literally just knocked on the door and said, hi, my name's Simon Squibb. I've got a gardening company, which I didn't have. Uh, and would you like me to take care of your garden? And to my surprise, they said yes. And then I, I did a bit of price discovery. How much do you want to pay? And, and got to an agreed price. And then uh, walked away very happy with myself that I got someone to say yes to uh, letting me take care of their garden, only to realize I didn't have any equipment or any money to buy the equipment. So um, I decided I better knock on quite a few houses, which, and I knocked on 100 houses in one day, got nine people to say yes to me being their gardener, and then went back the following day and asked them all for a deposit. And with that deposit money, I bought the equipment, and that's how it all started. You say you knocked on 100 doors. Now, sales is a numbers game. A lot of people may have given up at around number 20, 25. What was it that told you that you've got to you've got to go large if you want this to work? Because because that ratio 100 to nine, a lot of people listening to this who aren't in business will go like, wow, you know, that's not a very good batting average. But hey, it worked. Yeah, I, I remember it very clearly. You know, this is uh, you know, a long time ago for me now, 25, 30 years ago. But I, I remember it like it was yesterday. And, and my mindset was I didn't have anybody telling me, you know, you've got to follow through, which I know very well now as an entrepreneur. You've got to keep going. It was, it was a couple of things. First of all, uh, I had no money. So, you know, <laughs> and, and that's a big motivator. I, I literally was going, I starved for four days. So, you know, th these things will motivate you to keep going. And if I, if I didn't make it work, if I didn't get the numbers up to get enough money deposit wise to buy the equipment i couldn't fulfill the first person that said yes is order right so it, it was literally desperation i mean i don't i don't think it was me particularly you know motivated to follow through other than the fact that you know if i didn't make this idea work that i suddenly had i, I would literally not eat and not be able to pay rent and and, and i had no, they, they call it burning the boats you know in, in, in yeah. greek you know, basically, I burnt my boats. So if I didn't make this work, I, I couldn't go back to the old island. I had to make the island I'd landed on work. And, and then literally, this was the only idea I had to make money. Um, so I had to keep knocking until I got enough people saying yes to kind of justify deposit-wise being enough to buy the equipment. So it was just like that, really. It was, it was, so it was you, just you gave up school, and there is quite an amazing number of very successful entrepreneurs that don't have much formal education you being one of them. Why do you think that is? Well, I guess 
Uh, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, I, I personally, even today, think that school does not teach the skills of the real world, and they don't teach you business. Very, certainly, you know, even in business school, I think they, they teach you um, to look at history, but they don't teach you what's coming. And so I think the, that for me, school always never performed, it, and I never really felt challenged in school. I never really enjoyed it. And I always felt like, and I still feel like this today, it's, it's a memorization system. If you, if you can read a book and remember it for the test the following day, you'd do well in school. But I, I never really liked just remembering pointless information that I you know, could get elsewhere easily these days from Google, for example. Why do I need to remember things that I can just tap my fingers on the screen and get the information? I like to learn the EQ pieces, the, the human interaction, the, the sales interaction, looking at someone in the eye and figuring out you know, what will make them say yes to buying my gardening services. You know, that, that was interesting to me. And I think school didn't teach you how to negotiate. School didn't teach you how to price out a service or, or how to market yourself and your company. And so that's the, that's the stuff I really enjoyed. And, and I always felt like school didn't offer that. I didn't really realize that school didn't offer that until I left school. And it wasn't until I actually needed to do a living, I realized the skills I actually needed weren't remembering every capital in the world, but you know how to, uh, how to actually uh, convince someone that you're trustworthy enough to, to give them a deposit to, build a, to go out and clean their garden for them later. So that was the hard thing, and school never taught me that. But I was absolutely um, hooked the first week of being an entrepreneur in, in the whole like, process of building something from nothing that's in your head in reality. So where did you go from that? Because I know you eventually went to Hong Kong, but you're 15 at this stage. How did that business go? The first business did it? Was it a? I mean, it obviously fed you, but was it a success? I I would say it was not a success financially. I think it taught me a lot of things, and I um, initially I, I made quite a lot of money actually from it, but but, but due to very uh, inexperienced knowledge and things like partnerships, uh, managing cash flow. Um, understanding that you know there'd be seasons for example this is just stuff I didn't <laughs> I didn't even really think about so in, in the beginning I am um, it was it was you know um, early spring when I started it so it was all everyone you know, wanted their gardens prepared for summer I didn't really you know know that winter time would come and no one really wanted to do anything with their gardens much so you know I, I, these things meant that it started off really well but due to you know lack of experience, it, it didn't do very well. You know, a year in. Um, however, I think the experience of building a business led me on to then start another business and another business. I, I've started 17 companies in total, 13 of them with no money. Um, I'm lucky enough that you know, my last company, Fluid, I sold to PwC for more money than I'll ever need. But, but to be honest, you know, I've enjoyed building businesses with no money. That's always been uh, really exciting to me. When you say no money, you mean no one else's money but your own i mean no one else's money and often no money on my side either the gardening company i had i had no money yeah it's not like i said right i've raised money from someone or i've got an investor or you know I, i've got a bit of savings i, I literally had nothing um li literally nothing so n no equipment um you know one week's worth of clothes you know one pair of shoes um, you know, it really was starting from the very basics. And, and I love now um, the learning that you actually don't need money to start a business. A lot of business building starts in the mind and with a bit of effort because so many people say they need money to start a business. And, and it's actually not true. You, you just need the right mindset to start a business is what I learned for that process. So how did that take you to Hong Kong? So there are other businesses that you were running in Britain. The, the decision to move to Hong Kong, how did that all come about then? And at what age? Yeah, I was um, 23 years old when, when that came about. A, cu a couple of things happened. I had a, another business called Accommodation Express, which was kind of an early dot-com concept. Um, it, it probably could have been lastminute.com or bookings.com, but 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 I, I'm, it was basically a very simple model. The hotels in, uh, used to get a lot of phone calls back in these days. This is 1997-ish. Um, and, and people would ring up the hotel to make a booking, and the hotel would often say, I'm sorry, we're full and be very proud that they were full in the hotel and just kind of put the phone down, nothing they can do because they can't you know, make an extra room for a guest calling up. And I saw an opportunity that there was a kind of a wasted um, piece of marketing there. The hotel marketed to people that they had rooms, people had rung them to get a room and they were full and they would turn them away. So I said to the hotels, instead of turning them away, why don't you send them to me? I'll find them an equivalent room because there's other hotels in the area that aren't as good as marketing as you are. 
and there's there's spare rooms still available just not at the hotel they've called this is all pre-internet and just before the internet really took off and um and basically so we then took those bookings we gave the hotel commission of eight percent for referring it to us and the hotel that we placed it with gave us a 20 percent commission so we were making a, about a 12 percent margin and every time that phone rang and the hotel would turn them away suddenly they were turning that into money and, and secondly, we were then taking that unhappy customer who couldn't get the room they wanted into a happy customer and finding them a room they could they could get. And that business did quite well. Um, and I sold it. And when I sold it, I got a bit of advice that it would be a good idea um, to maybe travel for nine months because I wouldn't have to pay capital gains tax on the money I generated <laughs> uh, from from that sale. So a friend of mine was living in Hong Kong and said, "Hey, why don't you um, why don't you come and visit?" So I, I, that's what I did. I said, right, I've, I've had a, you know, experience since 15 years old of building businesses, and why don't I go see the world? And went to visit my friend in Hong Kong with a little bit of money in my pocket. And when I got to Hong Kong, my whole life changed. I, I just realized how big the world was. Like you said earlier, I grew up in Sydney. It's a small town in England. Um, I'd spent a bit of time in London, but not much. Spent quite a lot of time in Cambridge. That was probably the biggest city I'd, I'd ever really got to know, Cambridge. And then I went to Hong Kong, which is the second most expensive city in the world to live, a powerhouse of uh, ingenuity and innovation. And it blew my mind. And when I got there, I was actually going against the tide because it was 1997 and Hong Kong was being handed over by the British back to the Chinese. Uh, it'd been uh, colonized for 100 years by the British. So all the British people were leaving as I was arriving. And, and that led to some amazing opportunities because there was a lot of things that British people were doing there that suddenly weren't being done. And, and I saw some market gaps and decided to set up shop there. So what was it about Hong Kong then? Just tell me about like, you've, you've spoken about uh, work-life balance and how it really isn't a thing. And you suddenly realized that in Hong Kong. Can you just take me through what happened there? How it, yeah, cha well, how it changed your mindset? I think when I first got to Hong Kong, well, first of all, when I when I arrived, anyone that's been to Hong Kong will know what I'm talking about. The skyline is just like like something out of the future. You know, you've got on the um, harbour front, like buildings 88 stories high, you know, scattered across the whole of the harbour. And you just sit there and, you, and what you realise if you read about Hong Kong is it has no natural resources. So everything you see in front of you is, is, is made by someone's mind put into reality. It's not like you know Saudi Arabia or, or these markets where they have oil, they have natural resources, then funds these mega structures and these mega creations. Hong Kong has none of that. It is simply about brain power. And I just, I just, I think I got inspired by the, you know, the unbelievable stories of people that had gone to Hong Kong with nothing and then ended up owning 88 uh, story buildings um, and, and building out, you know, empires and, and and I, I know that I, I think what, that first step was um, when I started working in that environment, that, that people there just didn't have this work-life balance story that I think England we have in abundance. There was no like start at nine and finish at five. Although I was self-employed in England, I still felt like, oh, I better have my, you know, my weekends to myself. I better have some downtime. And what I learned in Hong Kong uh, and I think trained me was that, you know, work and life are the same thing. Culturally, for example, that some of the people that I worked with, you know, at the weekends they'd invite me around to their homes and, and we would hang out as families and there was no separation between the business deal and the relationship and your personal life. And it completely transformed my mindset around what was work-life balance. And suddenly, I think that, that, that made it very important whatever you spent time on that you really enjoyed because it was actually your life. So, for example, the clients you had, you better like them because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. You know, one of my clients for my agency business which I set up in Hong Kong called Fluid, which is the one I mentioned earlier, I sold to PwC. I used to go on his boat on a Sunday and hang out with him. You know, it, it all became very personal. And it's only it's only nine million people in Hong Kong. So it's also it's like it's, it's a very tight knit community. There's often one or two degrees of separation as well, which is an amazing thing from a network perspective. But it just changed my mindset about work-life balance, about potential of what was what you were able to achieve as a human being, and what was possible, um, and then access. I think I just realized you know, in, in England, access is sometimes quite hard. There is an age restriction on access. If you're not old enough, you can't be a manager, for example, or if you're, um, you know, if, that, there's always this you know, structure like who's bothering me now in England, whereas in Hong Kong, it's like, how can I help you and how can you help me? It completely transformed my mindset.
And was it culturally different, like business-wise? Were people more likely to take a chance on... Because on, on, you would have been unproven, really, at that stage. Were they more likely, you know, in the local market, w would they have been more likely to take a chance on you than they would, say, if you'd started up something in London? It's a very good question, and I think that there are... It's quite a complicated answer. When I first went to Hong Kong, people would tell me, oh, it's very different here. You know, in Hong Kong, there's a thing called face, you know, where, you know, where if you, you have to give people respect and you have to, you know, you have to give your elders respect and you have to have, you know, all this um, structure around how you deal with people. And as I, I spent 20 years in Asia in total. So what I realized, actually, a, a lot of that, there's also um, face in England. You know, people don't want to be disrespected or told they're stupid or you know if you have a client and you're in a meeting and you tell the boss of that company that they've got it wrong and they're an idiot you're not gonna win you know win friends and influence people so so there actually wasn't that much difference that as time went on, i realized you know people in asia love their children <laughs> people in asia breathe oxygen and eat three meals a day you know and, and actually there's just slight nuanced differences like they might read the newspaper back to front compared you know there's certain ways of reading text from top to bottom there's there's slight nuances that are different but the basic fundamentals of capitalism of love of uh, kindness they were you know they were all prevalent and as always if you were sincere and you were decent just like in england i think this follows through too eventually people will trust you but you but people didn't trust me quicker in hong kong I think there's a couple of reasons why. There's not that many English people um, in Asia. You know that you're you're kind of a, you're still unique, um, and and there's some kudos given to you because you've broken out of the you know the, the typical system in England. Mm -hmm. And then um, if you've got something interesting to say, I did find that Asian businesses would listen to you, whereas English companies quite often had a bit more of a traditional mindset. They were stuck in their ways. I could tell you some stories about conversations I've had with English brands like Woolworths, where they, you know, they just wouldn't listen if you suggested they should go online. I did suggest to Woolworths they should go online once, and they told me no one's going to buy Pick a Mix, Simon, <laughs> online, you know, and missed the point completely. Whereas in Asia, because it's an emerging market as well, there's this mindset about how can we leapfrog infrastructure that we don't need and go straight to consumers? What can we do that's innovative? And I had a talent for knowing what the future looked like. And so I could have a conversation with brands out there and they were quite willing to, to leapfrog into digital, for example, which was the early 2000 uh, part of what I did. I helped a lot of brands go online. Um, I built an, this agency, Fluid, which helped brands like Estee Lauder and CNN get into Asia. And they were very, very open to you know creative ideas. And I think that's where I really flourished uh, in, in, in Asia, which perhaps I wouldn't have done in England because they don't really have, if I go to BT and suggest that they should dump the phone line and focus on nothing but Wi-Fi, you know, there might have been a, a bit of a backlash in early 2000, right? Yeah, but you look back at the companies that didn't take that message, the big ones, like the Kodaks of this world, who would have thought they would fail, but wow. Well, you know. this is it. Yeah, yeah, I actually have a TED talk on that. I did a TED talk about um, Kodak and how Kodak actually invented the digital camera. Did they? Wow. Yeah, they, they were the people, but they were so scared of what it meant that they buried it hoping it would never come to the surface, of course, because their whole model was around film. Yeah. But what they should have done, of course, is embrace the digital camera and, and own that market. Um, but yeah. no, they, they, they can't. People can't innovate what they're holding on to the past. But a lot of English companies do hold on to the past. Um, BT is a good example of that, right? I mean, they, yeah. they, they ha actually had a mobile phone division, um, O2, which they sold. Yeah. So they actually sold the future. <laughs> yeah, um, they've gone back now with their other one, haven't they? Now they do, they do do mobile, but they did sell their original one, oh two, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. The, what was actually their future? They sold it off as not core cool to their main business, which you know it's just it's just insane. Did you find um, it's probably different with you because you worked very hard anyway? But there's this thing called an immigrant work ethic. Did you find that when you were outside Britain and you were now in a different country that you just seemed to work harder? Uh, there's something in that. I would, I would probably again add some nuance to it, and I would say, first of all, when you move somewhere new, I didn't have any friends, you know. So there's, and in some respects, that could be a good thing. First of all, there's no peer pressure yeah. of, of what you should be doing, and second is, you know, work was my only way of socialising. So, so there's an element of like, well, if I work, I can you know, on a Sunday be hanging out with the client I'm working for and brainstorm some ideas and 
go for a swim and you know it's all kind of mixed in one and i think that that you know i guess is an immigrant piece too you know it's um i don't have other friends that are calling me on a sunday to go and see them which is what it was like when i first moved there i also think there's another element to it which is and i try to tell people this today in my in my new um uh, goal of helping one million people start a business of their own is i try to explain to people that taking risk when you're young is is the best time to take risk and 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 i think because you've got less to lose <laughs> you've got no, you've got less to lose you've got less responsibility you haven't got kids you haven't got a mortgage you know you haven't got these things that perhaps create a monthly requirement of income and and you can take more chance and i think when you go overseas that this is how i felt i felt i could go to hong kong i could fail and come back with a travel story and that was the worst that would happen you know and that would still be interesting <laughs> Whereas in England, and even when I was doing my gardening company and I did my accommodation business, I always had this feeling that, you know, England, if you fail, everyone's going to know. And it was, it was, I was scared to fail in the same way. Whereas in Hong Kong, I was literally, I would try big, crazy ideas with this feeling like, well, if it fails, it's not the end. It doesn't matter. It's all an experience. And I think Hong Kong gave that to me that, that England didn't. Yeah. Um, but eventually I, I got a reputation in Hong Kong and I got I, I became quite successful there and and I and I, then I started to also have fear of failure because once you get well known and respected within the community it comes back again just like it does in England for a lot of people you don't want your family to see you fail you don't want your friends to see you fail so when I started to succeed in Hong Kong there was definitely a moment where I had to continue to take risk and fight back against that urge not to take so much risk because people would see you fail at things and then continue to embr embrace failure so how important is risk? Well, I, I mean, I, I have a whole thing about it. I, I, I think there's, there's, you get luck. I've been lucky in business. Anyone that's been successful in business that doesn't say they've been lucky is, is, is not telling the truth. I've had an awful a lot of luck. That's, I would say, for example, my last company getting bought by PwC. I never planned for that business to get bought by PwC. It was luck that they decided as a company, as an organization, to pivot into the service business that I had. And I happen to be the only large independent business available for them to buy, you know. So, so you know that that is luck. Now, of course, people always defend me and say, "Well, Simon, you worked hard," and so on. But you know, getting back to your question, I think to, there are two types of luck. There is the random luck, the luck where you're born, for example, or um, you know, life you're born into. That's called coronavirus. You know, bad luck, if you want. You know, there's nothing we can do about it. It's happened. But there's another type of luck I discovered, and this luck you can influence. And, and three ways you influence luck. In other words, three ways to make sure that you are luckier in life. The first is what you just mentioned, risk. The more risk you take, the more chances of luck. If you take no risk, you seriously reduce your chances of, of luck. So risk and fear are, are totally linked. And I learned quite young that fear was a good feeling. Fear was not something, most people when they feel fear, the, their instant reaction is to try and reduce that feeling of fear as quickly as they can so they don't feel fear anymore. Which is a natural but, hardwired thing about humans, isn't it? Is to reduce the amount of fear and the pain, emotional pain that you're suffering, but it's not necessarily great for getting on in life. Well, to be honest, my, my feeling is if you go back to nature, fear was given to us as a, almost like a superpower to push us through hard moments and hard things. So I don't think you're meant to get rid of it as soon as you can. So, for example, I remember at 23 years old when, you know, I was like, come to Hong Kong. And a friend of mine said, oh, you don't want to go to Hong Kong. You know, it's very, um, you know, it's, 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 it's got triads and are you sure and all these scary things. I remember having this feeling of fear, but that kind of drove me to push through the idea of not doing it. So I, and later on, I got asked to do public speaking, for example. And I remember when the first time I got asked to do public speaking, I felt this fear. But I thought this is a good thing. I'm going to use it to make sure I practice to make sure I get good at public speaking to make I, I leverage fear to make me run faster to be stronger to think harder about things and so I've learned to realize that fear was given to us as an asset not something to suppress or get away from and I think you're right when you when you say people think it's something that they um, they should avoid but actually I, I say to people if you want to get luckier in life embrace fear lean into it every time you feel fear do exactly the opposite to what that you know instinct is to stop the fear and that actually will increase your luck because ultimately fear is risk more risk equals more luck there's two other elements to it but i i, I could go on to, about it forever so so why did you move back to the uk um i hit 40 and um 
I, I mean, it's, it's a complicated answer. The initial answer is I felt like I, I, I was getting quite soft and, and life was getting too easy. You know, I, I had a driver, I had hundreds of people working for me. I can make anything happen. I know this sounds like, oh, you know, this is a, this is a hard luck story, is it, Simon? You know, that doesn't sound like that much hard luck. But at 40, I just felt like I had reached a certain plateau and Hong Kong was, was a great place, but I felt like I missed my roots. I'm English. I'd been away 20 years you know, or so, um, or 20, 18, 19 years. And I felt like you know, I, I should get back to my roots. And I felt like I'd kind of conquered that part of the world at that moment in my life. And I had a conversation with my wife. My, my wife um, and, and I had been in business together 15 years. And I, I, I was going to work one morning very early. And I said to her, I'll be back at midnight. And she said, why are you working so hard? You know? And I'm like, well, you know, we've got to you know, make, it, make these businesses work. And she's like, Simon, they're already working. You know, why are you actually doing this? And, and she made me think I bought into a bit of an ego um, process where, you know, I was self-fulfilling. It's like, I guess, success breeds success. But actually, it wasn't money wasn't buying me the only thing I think money buys you. I think the only thing money buys you is time. So if my time was still like chock-a-block all day long working, I hadn't actually um, enjoyed my success. So my wife and I decided to take a couple of years off, have a child, because we were getting old, but we hadn't had a child yet, um, get into shape, and rethink what it is we want to do with our lives going forward. So that's what we did. I sold all my assets, all my businesses, um, in Hong Kong, um, I kept a small share in one business, and then um, yeah, moved back to England uh, three years ago now. And you're living in London? Yeah, living in North London. And so, Loving. is the lifestyle in London compared to Hong Kong? I suppose London probably seems quiet by comparison, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean that's it. A lot of my family live in Cambridge and St Neots, so and when they come to London, they always tell me, "Oh, it's so noisy and busy here." But I um I don't think so. I, I I'm I'm living I'm living in Hampstead, um, which is right near Hampstead Heath, and I actually think I'm living in the country. It feels so quiet, and um and 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 like living in a village. But lifestyle wise, I mean, as for me, I mean, having a child changes your life anyway. So I, we had a baby. He's um you know as he's grown up, my whole life changed because of him anyway. My priority has been to put him to bed every night and to be there in the morning for him. And, and I've really enjoyed being a, you know, a kind of present full-time father, but he had that changed my life because before that I would have been out at nine, eight o'clock uh, by eight o'clock at a meeting of some sort by 12 o'clock, having a business lunch, six o'clock doing a talk at some event somewhere, you know, so, so my life changed partly because of not location, but, but um, my priority list. And, um, but England itself, it is a very different pace of life. Um, even in London, where people think it's fast, it's not fast. You know, it is. It is. It's very nice. I like it at this stage in my life. I like this pace of England at this stage in my life. But for um, younger me, it, it, no, I realise this is it's too slow. Asia was. You know, it's fast, and you are. You know, you're working all day, every day. There's no such thing as Saturday and Sunday. You just don't. People don't think of things in that context. So now, when I see, you know, I see people like Monday to Friday working, Saturday, Sunday off. Um, it all feels quite, quite slow. But as I say, at this stage of my life, um, I'm quite happy with that. Something you mentioned earlier, which is your challenge to help one million businesses. Talk to me about that. Or business yeah, startups. I, yeah. Well, um, I uh, decided in January to uh, February that I would start working again. Um, and what I wanted to do was kind of go back and help that 15 year old me. Um, and, you know, I, I, I analyzed all the things that I've learned, you know, how to build businesses. And um, I felt like I could help people start a business of their own. And then, um, and I thought, well, how am I gonna start? So the first thing I, I started w was with a podcast show. And I thought over the last 30 years, I've, I I've have a network of some of the m most successful entrepreneurs in the world. Why don't I interview those people and get their knowledge downloaded that I can then share with the rest of the world? Um, so I, that's what I started doing. And as I started getting that knowledge from these amazing entrepreneurs, I, um, I, I started getting a lot of phone calls from, and emails and, and so on from people saying, you know, I want to start a business, but I don't know how. I need to raise money. What shall I do? So I started making content to help people um, raise money or how to start a business with no money because there's so many ways to do it. And then people would ask me about brand and how to build a brand. So I did a whole you know, video blog about that. And then next thing I know, 
you know, I'm getting so inundated with inquiries, I can't actually keep up with all the inquiries. So I thought, well, why don't I build a platform, a more structured platform that gives people all the things they need to start a business of their own. So that 15 year old me, if I day one known about um, the Purposeful Project, which is the ultimate top co of our company, then I could have got all the resources I needed from, from that company without having to learn the painful way about partnerships and how to do them wrong and how to hire people and how not to hire people, how to get clients on board and how to win business, but how to also make sure you, you charge properly and how to charge properly, price discovery. All of these things that are nuances of starting a business, I now have built a platform to give to people for free to help them start a business of their own and then covid hit so it feels really relevant now with you know people being made unemployed talented people can't get a job coming out of university i think uh, now is the time uh, for people to start a business of their own so i i, I decided um, you know i would set myself a target i saw a headline in in the newspaper saying one million people were going to get laid off in the uk alone because of covid and so it seemed like a good target to take those people that are you know, talented and shouldn't be out of work, give them the tools they need to start a business of their own and, and do just that. So I say a million as if I don't, I think it's just the beginning, but when I say it to people, they think it's a big number and un unachievable, but we'll see. And what kind of businesses do you help? What's the criteria to get your expertise involved in there? There's, there's no criteria. Um, I think it's, it's literally, there's two types of, I guess organizations that we're helping right now or two types of people we're helping right now one is um, people that have an existing business actually that have struggled right now for one reason or another they're, they're, COVID might have affected them they're not online for example and they want to know how to survive and innovate to help them grow their business um, there are some businesses that are also doing quite well and just want some pointers about how to grow so we have a lot of people like that individuals founders um, and, and entrepreneurs. But um, recently we have a lot of people coming, for example, from university that are graduating or have graduated, were expecting to get a job and now can't get the job. Hmm. So they're, they're asking us, well, okay, if I can't get a job, maybe I should create one for myself. What should I do? Um, and so, you know, idea generation is part of what we, we do, helping people figure out um, if they've got an idea, how they could make it real. Um, so, um, so those sorts of so those sorts of um, profiles right now. But we have personally one of the things I really love about where I'm at at this stage in my life is that we can help people with no expectation in return, and I think that's quite important because. So this isn't a, a dragon's den thing where you want uh, a, a piece of their of their business. Uh, uh, no, not necessarily. We actually do have an investment piece where we do take equity, but any profit from any upside in that business goes back into the platform. So in other words, all the profit we do make from sponsors and partners goes back into the platform to provide the services to people that want to start a business for free. We will never charge people. And one of the reasons I think this is very important is if you look at the landscape of people that want to start businesses, there are people that can raise money quite easily. They often come from affluent backgrounds themselves already. And, and so that, that's fine. But there's a lot of people that, for example, unemployed that couldn't afford to pay anybody anything to get help. And if you don't offer this service for free, they have no access to to the resource. And there are a lot of resources out there like accelerators and, and so on. But you tend to have to have an existing business that's doing quite well for them to then invest in you. But a lot of people don't even have that first stage set. So they never get going. Um, again, I think about myself at 15. I had no money. It's not like if someone came to me and said, I'm a business guru and I can help you. All I'm going to charge you is X. I, I just wouldn't be able to hire them. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of business coaches out there and they have to earn a living, you know, all due respect to them. I understand that. But my platform is all about uh, my, my service and my network helping people for free. So I've managed to convince 62 of my entrepreneurial friends to give their time for free and under a similar pledge that they will help people for free with no expectation in return. So I'm able to scale it outside of just me helping and get other people to give their time. But the key is we are not looking to make money out of people. We're, we're looking to help them. And the, we ask them one thing, which is, if we help you and you do well, you give back later in the same way. That's it. So if someone's interested in, uh, in getting your help and advice, is that all the details at your website? Yeah, purposefulproject.com is um, what we're doing. Of course, we have the podcast show, The Good Luck Club. Um, Which we're going to get onto in a bit. Don't worry about yeah. that. That's why yeah. we're here. Yeah, yeah. yeah but there's is, so, but there's so many other things I wanted to ask you about before we got there. You know. Yeah, yeah. fair. No, no problem. And I, I, but I, I think our whole platform is um, ultimately uh, kind of broken into parts, like inspiration, 
knowledge, insights and investment. These are generally the things that people need to, to make a business work. And so, yeah, so it's all, it's all there on our website. It's, it depends on what you need. Um, you can reach out different parts of our, our platform depending on what you need. And yeah, we have webinars, of course, who doesn't these days, but we have webinars um, training people how to you know, start businesses from scratch, how to build brand, how to structure their companies legally, all the things you could, even the questions you're not even, you don't even know to ask. You know, a lot of people don't know what they don't know. No, we give you the questions and we try to give you the answers all in the same place. Few things before we get to the podcast. You went off social media for a while. What was that all about? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm actually, um, I, I, I'm worry about social media. I mean, there's quite a lot of good movies out recently, like Social Dilemma. There's a good movie about that. It, but, but basically, a bit like I was saying about work earlier, you get addicted. You think you're doing something because you have to. And actually, you're doing it because you're addicted. I, I have an addictive personality. So that's why, for example, I've never drunk alcohol because I know if I drank alcohol, I'd probably over drink. Um, you know, I have one vice, which is chocolate, and I definitely eat too much of it. And, and social media is one of those things that I, um, you know, I would always say uh, when I was running my last company, you know, I have to do social media. You know, you have to communicate with your customers and you have to promote. But I find myself you know, at dinner with my family on social media. And, and therefore, you know, to me that if I make that post at nine o'clock at night, it, is it really that important? Or should I be outsourcing it or helping get, paying someone else whose time zone might be one o'clock in the afternoon, not nine p.m. at dinner um, to do it for me instead? And so I felt like I'd become addicted to social media and was, it was saying that I had to do it for the business when in reality I was doing it because I was addicted. And I hate the idea of anything being addicted, addictive in my life. So, so then, you know, I, I basically stop using it and see what happens. Um, and I've just made the pledge again to do it at weekends for myself and my team. We also, we can schedule posts, but we, we don't go on social media ourselves. We can help it. So you're on a social got, media diet right now. How long, oh, how long were you, oh, I see. And how long were you off it then? Uh, a year and a half. Wow. That's a yeah. long time. In fact, there'd yeah. be new ones popping up while you were off it, probably. Like TikTok's yeah. still pretty new, isn't it? It probably happened yeah. while you were off it. Well, yeah, and I, and I, I went back on TikTok. Uh, well, I went on TikTok about three months ago. I now have 62,000 followers. So, you know, don't worry, folks. You can pick up where you left off. <laughs> so what, soon, did, you, what did you learn from, from being disconnected from social media then for that the, length of time? Uh, I, I guess I learned, first of all, that um, you, you don't need to share everything. And I learned to engage with people, not stare at my phone. And I, I got fit, actually. <laughs> um, you know, you, I think when you're not staring down at your phone in an, in an unhuman way with your neck crooked down and suddenly you've lost two hours of time because you were looking at social media, you could have gone and done a run. You could have gone to the gym. You could have, you know, um, worked out or just gone for a walk. And so, um, so yeah, so I really enjoyed that time. Having said that, I am now back on social media in quite a heavy way because I have this cause. I want people to know that there's a service out there that can help them for free, especially now. So I think social media has its place. Um, I always like the working concept of you work hard for seven years and you have two years off. I, I always like this model. You know, a lot of people say, you know, get to retirement and then stop working. But I actually really like this idea where you, you know, you really get heads down on something, you create something, you build something, and then you take time off. So uh, partly now I'm on my uh, back on my seven year cycle, I feel like. So, you know, I will work very hard. I will build something meaningful, hopefully useful to people. Uh, and, and then I will take time off again. So I think, you know, there's, there's, but again, I also think you have to, as, as you probably heard a million times from a million people, but you know, life's a, a marathon, not a sprint, right? Which is often said by people that have never run a marathon, I think, but, but, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, it is, it is. And I think that you sometimes have to pace it out. So that's why I say I'm seven years now making this platform work, but I will still try to take the weekends off where I can, as far as social media is concerned and, and try to, you know, lift my head up, stay healthy, you know, and, and be present for my family. Let's talk about the podcast then. It's called the Good Luck Podcast. And up until I spoke to you, I had no idea why it was called that. But now I've got a pretty good idea why it's called the Good Luck Podcast. Tell me about it then. How did it all start? 
Well, I mean, I, I, well, I, you I mentioned felt... you mentioned you had all those, those friends who were entrepreneurs. Was that the the original motivation, just to get the information out there, or were you genuinely interested in their stories? I think a bit of both. I, I knew I knew some people that had started businesses from scratch that were just mind blowingly interesting stories, and I knew if um, if I could get those stories downloaded and and shared with uh, enough people, that would inspire people to start a business with purpose and to think about starting a business of their own. And these people, I mean, what I try to do is interview the world's most successful entrepreneurs, but the ones you've never heard of. So, you know, I've got famous people coming on, um, but I, I actually like it when you've got someone that's done something absolutely mind blowing, but you don't know their name. You've never even heard of them. And so I try to interview people like that. They're not necessarily getting on stage like Elon Musk every day, um, telling people what they should do. They they um, can be reserved. They can be um, you know um, just getting on with building their businesses. Don't have a lot of time, um, but they have a story that, if shared, can shed light on how to build a business for someone out there that wants to do uh, their own business. And so I just knew if I could if I could convince uh, my network to give an hour of their time, I could do two things. One, um, document their story, which also is a personal thing for me. My father never documented his business career. And as a 15 year old, I never, I never really understood what he did or how he did it. He was quite a successful business person, but he, you know, he died suddenly and I never got to find out really how he did it. And so, you know, I always wished that there was a podcast out there of my father explaining what he did and how he did it and his moral code and his, his focus on life and what he thought about things. And so I thought to myself, you know, having uh, all these brilliant people out there in the world with their stories, I must get them on a podcast and and then their families and their children and their grandchildren will be able to listen to this later and hear the story of how their mother or father or you know grandfather or grandmother uh, managed to build a business and and also at the same time hopefully those stories there'd be nuggets in there um, that other people could could leverage what surprised me about doing the podcast and 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 does really excite me today is i've been an entrepreneur my whole life now, I've built 17 companies. I've invested in 66 startups. I've seen it all, I thought, until I listened to these stories. And I, I have learned, every time I've done this podcast, as a person interviewing them, I have learned so much. But sometimes I get off the podcast and I'm like, if no one ever listens to that, I've still, I, I've got something from it. You know, <laughs> like, um, hopefully, you know, and, and luckily people are also hearing it. But, but, but you know, ultimately, um, I've really enjoyed the experience of listening to these people's stories. And it's inspired me to build what I'm building today um, and to really push the envelope of what's possible. So who's been your favorite guest so far? Well, that's like asking my favorite child. That would, but there that, must that would, be one that stands out. There must be. You know, there's just, there's just, a, there's quite a, I have to say every single podcast, I, I've now interviewed uh, nearly 60 people. Um, and I, I honestly can say every single podcast, there's been something in each of the podcasts that I've, I've really enjoyed. Um, there, you know, there's always going to be, I guess, ones that I, I know some of the people so well. So, for example, I interviewed uh, a guy called Patrick Lee. He's the founder of Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the very uh, successful movie rating website, even today, um, it's you know really the go to thing for any movie studio. They've got to get high rating on that or their movie won't do well. So he created it. And so just listening to his stories, but you know, I, I invested in him. So I have, a, I have a, an, an interest in his his life and I invested in his businesses. And, and so, you know, there's a personal thing there for me that, you know, I've been a part of his journey. So, it, you know, he's telling his story. It's absolutely unbelievable. He's brutally honest, which I really love because at the end of the podcast, he talks about his failures as well as his success. And he talks about how after Rotten Tomatoes, he's done five startups since then that haven't done as well. You know, and you kind of think if you've had one success, you know exactly, you know, how it all works. And so therefore your second one, and your third one should be a cinch, you know. Um, but, you know, I love it when people are honest. And so Patrick Lee is definitely one of those ones that I really appreciate his honesty. I've, I've enjoyed kind of breaking the mold of what an entrepreneur is. So I interviewed Adele Parks. She's um, the second most successful author in the UK. She's the most best-selling fictional author. And um, she... And she, I mean, you wouldn't think a writer is an entrepreneur. I mean, you tell people writers, they don't, they don't think of writers as entrepreneurs. Uh, but her story is so entrepreneurial. You know, uh, when she started out, single parent, writing books, carrying a you know, child around, 
you know, um, trying to uh, launch a book while, um, while you know, looking after her uh, a baby. It's just fascinating, you know, the hustle involved in what she's now a successful author and everyone just thinks, oh, she's talented. You know, she just wrote a book. Isn't that easy? Without knowing the nuance of what it's like to be an entrepreneur and a writer. Um, I just interviewed finally an Adele Lim. She's the uh, creator or co-creator for uh, Crazy Rich Asians, which is a smash hit movie. Again, mm. you, would, you wouldn't think as, you know, a movie is a big movie studio behind it. So, you know, it, an entrepreneur is behind that movie. And, and fascinating listening to her story because she was actually um, paid a lot less than the male co-creator for that. And so she then made a stand when the movie studio wanted to make a second crazy rich agent movie and said, I'm not going to do it because, you know, you don't you don't see me as equal to, to the co-creator because you're paying him differently. It's just fascinating anyway. So, so every single one of the stories to me, um, what I really like is they're authentic. People are really honest. You know, mental health comes up. Um, talking about the struggle of being a sole founder, building a business on your own, managing, you know, cash flow, worrying about paying your staff, you know, not going home and burdening your family with your stress. So who do you tell? You know, the, the nitty gritty of getting through those things, I think, is immensely valuable to the next generation of entrepreneurs. So, so yeah, it's really hard to pick one. Just makes people feel less alone if they're uh, they're going through it, I guess. At, uh, yeah. At the same time, and. How hard was it technically? Because you don't have a broadcasting background or journalism or any of that. How hard was it to, to start a podcast from scratch? It turned out to be a lot easier than I thought. Um, I, I initially started out with a hundred pound microphone. I think every podcast show has, has done the same. A USB you know, I, microphone. Yeah. 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 Something like that. And um, it was a Christmas present from my wife. And, um, and, and I started out doing it very amateur hour, to be honest. And, and then... As I put it out and, and people gave me feedback, you know, being someone with pride, I, I wanted to improve the quality of the audio. I want to improve the quality of the video. And so I started researching. And, and what really sped up my whole process is I hired a couple of people that knew the industry. And, and they helped me with all the gear. Uh, so um, big, big shout out to Connor uh, and, 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 and the team there. You know, I basically, without, without, I learned a lot of stuff myself as well about YouTube. I got on TikTok. Now, I went back into these platforms and, and just used them. And you know, I spent the first couple of weeks just consuming content from those platforms. Picked up you know the nuances of each of the platform and then went back out and you know and built it up. The equipment was the same. I, I started out with the simple microphone, and next thing you know, I'm I'm giving you know Rode microphones. Um, I'm emptying my bank account into theirs as I <laughs> as I buy equipment and pad out studios and. And, and get all the all the professional stuff that you need to do it right. And but it was a process, a bit like my gardening company. I, I didn't go and buy twenty lawn mowers from day one. You know, I bought a crappy one um, from day one uh, with the deposit money that I got from the clients. And so I still apply the same process. I I don't go out and waste money on lots of equipment I don't need. I, I buy as I need. So um, you know, I've literally I think I'm now on my tenth backup card, one of these things. You know, okay. these backup memory card units. Yeah. You know, but at first, I just kept it on my laptop until my laptop started crying and, and breaking down. And then I said, OK, and I'll invest in some backup of, of the podcast. And, and so, you know, step by step, um, you, you, you increase your cost, um, but you also increase the quality, hopefully, along the way. And there's no advertising on it. Is that deliberate? Yeah, that's deliberate. I'm not against advertising, but I have a kind of I want to keep the podcast quite pure. And I, I have a lot of people that approach us for affiliate marketing. And again, I'm not against it. It's just that I don't want people to have to listen to the podcast to then be told that they should sign up to GoDaddy or they should sign up to the, this, that or the other. Um, I, I, and therefore, they click through, I make money off them. I, I wanted to try and keep it pure. Um, however, I am working on some big brand partnerships, but I didn't want to just initially do the affiliate partnership stuff and, and just make money off people clicking through and, and, and not necessarily sell something I 100% believe in. So um, I just wanted to keep the content pure. Plus myself personally, my, one of my gripes with podcasts is it takes me forever to get to the content. And, and so um, I thought it would be interesting to just run the content straight off the cuff, give it to people without any um, hassle and, and just let people, you know, get from the podcast what they could without me having or not having to sell them anything to, to make a living. And that's one of the great things about being able to do this business when I've kind of 
made all the money I need. <laughs> it's a beautiful position to be in because I, I can hopefully create pure things. A bit like my videos, people often, you know, say, well, you could charge me a consultancy sum and I'd be happy, you know, for you to charge me to help me with this business. And I say, well, here's all the content for free. You know, like I'd rather you invested that business in hiring people, invested back in your business and growing the business and making it COVID proof, you know, like, and that's actually really nice to be able to do that. Um, it's been interesting because sometimes with free, people get a bit confused. You know, they wonder what the catch is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's been nice to try and just keep it pure. But eventually, you know, I will have um, brand partnerships, um, not necessarily advertising, brand partnerships with the podcast. But but initially, I just wanted people to get straight to the content, it to be useful, and then them to get off without having anything, you know, shoved down their throats at the end. It's the Good Luck Podcast with Simon Squibb. It's where you get your podcasts. It's on Apple and Stitcher and everywhere you get podcasts. And it's also on podcast radio. What's next for Simon Squibb? Well, we've helped 42 people start a business so far. So um, we, we've got quite a lot of uh, more people to help over the next coming years. I, I hope that we can make an impact uh, and, and, and help the economy not be so effective. Um, I, we hope we can help people find their purpose in life. So. So my mission for the next seven years is is to help people find a business they love and build something that's purposeful to them. And hopefully uh, I'll have some time in between to uh, play with my son and watch him grow up. That, so if I achieve those two things and stay healthy in between, I'll be, I'll be happy. Simon, thanks for your time. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you. Likewise, thank you.